you like to go, Sue? Yeah, awesome. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name's uh, Corey Sells. I'm going to be your MC for today. Um, but before we start any proceedings at all, I would actually like to... Uh, Auntie Peggy was going to be here today, but she's been able to, able to make it. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that, on which we gather today, which are the Turrbal and Yuggera people, I believe, uh, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islander peoples with us in the room and also virtually today. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, like I said, my name is Corey Sells. Um, and whether you are joining us here in person or virtually, nice to meet you in a, an electronic kind of a way, um, we really appreciate your attendance here today and, and uh, opening up these conversations around um, mental health in sport and mental health in general is so important. So a little bit about myself first and, and why I'm standing up here. Aside from uh, my job, um, general managing a traffic management business in here in uh, Brisbane and New South Wales, I'm also a facilitator for an organisation called Outside the Locker Room um, and have been with Outside the Locker Room uh, since 2017. Um, bringing that up here to, to Queensland and, and introducing it to firstly um, the Aussie Rules fraternity and, and now extending that uh, further into other sports. Outside the locker room is an organisation where we attend uh, sporting clubs, schools and some workplaces and we run uh, education ses sessions uh, at those sporting clubs to open up these conversations and social issues. So those are things like mental health, um, which is a not negotiable for us actually, the first session that we run there. And that's about recognising mental health in our um, peers and, and also amongst ourselves and our pillars of strength that we can um, gather for ourselves. We do um, uh, substance abuse uh, awareness, so alcohol, um, drugs, gambling. Um, we also do leadership and culture sessions, social media and cyberbullying. So all the social issues, issues that really come up uh, in life we start to educate on. We do that through um, interactive sessions, so we don't sit in a classroom uh, like this. Everyone sits in pods and, and giving their answers and having discussions with us. The most important part of outside the locker room, though, is the welfare platform on the on the back end. So um, the reason I got involved is I was president of a football club and uh, realised that there was a whole lot of kids going through similar things that I went through when I was a young fellow. And but not a lot of people had the tools and the knowledge to be able to help those kids out. So. The education was out there and we, there was some fantastic education, but there wasn't, didn't seem to be the welfare platform um, to help the clubs and, and, and the participants. So in that welfare platform, we have people that sit on the back end where a participant or a club can uh, message us on, on, uh, on the app or via text, and they'll respond with um, some information around where that person can reach out to that, that best suits them, and or, or some information about how to help their, help their uh, peer. We partner with um, an organisation called Outside the Locker, uh, called Australian Counselling Association, and they have five and a half thousand counsellors around the country. And, and part of that um, app is a participant can go in there and type in their postcode, what they want to seek um, assistance for. So whether that's um, you know substance abuse or whether it's domestic violence or whatever that happens to be, how far they would like to travel from home, and it'll bring up the bios of all the counsellors within that area so they can go on and get a connection uh, through a photo and some information before they make that phone call to that counsellor. Uh, the reason I'm involved with that is I, I went through my own um, tumultuous childhood, which led to a, a fairly severe mental health um, issues myself, uh, which eventuated into substance abuse addiction um, and uh, recovered from that. I went started my recovery when I'm 27. I think I'm, everyone still goes through recovery, to be honest. Um, and that's led me down the path of uh, fulfilling my soul, which is helping people. So uh, uh, ended up here um, uh, to do this today. One uh, group or two groups of people we would like to acknowledge for outside the locker room is the Brisbane Lions have actually partnered with us in, um, in here in Brisbane and, uh, and another organisation called Epic Good Foundation. And the mandate from the Brisbane Lions was not just to go to Aussie Rules Clubs, that was not what they wanted to do. It was about getting out to the community through Aussie Rules, soccer, cricket, uh, schools, whatever that may be. They've allowed us the, uh, or allowed those clubs the financial capacity to be able to have that education in their in their uh, organisation. So we really appreciate uh, the partnership with Brisbane Lions and also Epic Good Foundation. 
So on behalf of the Mental Health Foundation Australia, its patrons, board of directors and chairperson, Mr. Vasan Shrinif, Shrinif <laughs> I practiced this all night last night. <laughs> I would like to welcome you to, all, to this major mental, National Mental Health Month event, the Sport and Mental Health Forum. So the National Mental Health Month is an initiative of Mental Health Foundation Australia to advocate for and raise awareness uh, of Australian mental health as a community. National Mental Health Month is unlike any other mental health awareness campaigns. It aims to bring Australians together in a nationwide conversation about mental health. The goal is to maintain this conversation for an entire month and hopefully with everybody here listening and beyond through a series of events. Mental Health Foundation Australia seek to reach out and educate as many Australians as possible to help reduce the stigma and facilitate the positive and not judgmental discussions surrounding mental health. With one in five Australians experiencing a mental health illness each year, it is time we give mental health the due attention it deserves. Throughout this month, many events have been organised in each state and territory of Australia aiming to attract and unite Australians of all ages and backgrounds to raise awareness of the need for better mental health for us all. This year, the theme of National Mental Health Month is post-pandemic recovery challenges and resilience. Every individual, and many are still facing huge challenges due to COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, this October, events were planned to embrace many different industries and community groups and people of all ages walking on the road to recovery and fostering resilience. And there's a hashtag here, hashtag resilience and recovery. In Queensland, Mental Health Foundation Australia have already held a childcare and mental health symposium, an appeal, and a walk for mental health last Sunday. Next Thursday, uh, Mental Health Foundation Australia are hosting the Defence and Mental Health Symposium, and then a gala dinner on uh, Saturday the 30th to wrap up the month. So today's forum will focus on crucial periods uh, for managing mental wellbeing in sport, including uh, aspiring to transition into elite sport, managing injury, dealing with external pressures, transitioning out of the activity in the limelight, and building an understanding for coaches and parents. Probably one of the most important parts there, I believe, in my own opinion. Uh, I would also like to advise you again, as a courtesy, that we are live streaming today's event and uh, recording it for distribution or, uh, for in part or for later, so my family can buy a copy um, at some other, another time. So please uh, join us in celebrating Mental Health Foundation Australia journey by uh, viewing this short video. Hi everyone, I'm Vasan Srinivasan, Chairperson of the Mental Health Foundation Australia. It's a privilege to lead this wonderful community-based mental health organisation in its 91st year of establishment. The MHFA has grown strength to strength over the past few years. With Victorian Mental Health Month in 2018, the National Mental Health Month occurring in 2019, 2020, and this year in 2021. Last year, COVID-19 did not stop us from achieving our National Mental Health Month campaign. I'm proud to say, we successfully shifted many events to a virtual platform, very much being able to pursue our objectives of raising awareness and advocating for better Australian mental health. Our primary aim is to reach out to and educate as many Australians as possible to help reduce stigma and to encourage constructive and non-judgmental dialogue on Australia's critical mental health issue. The highlight of last year's campaign was reaching out to 100,000 Australians all across the country for our national walks for mental health, both virtually through our MHFA app and physically in some states. What a grand success that was. In 2021, with pandemic still affecting many of us, we decided not to give up once again, curating a carefully chosen blend of virtual and physical events for Australians to participate in. This year, we have a new and improved MHFA app, giving people the opportunity to participate in National Mental Health Month from the palms of their hands. This year, theme is mental health and post-pandemic recovery challenges and resilience. Mental Health Foundation Australia is proud to partner with Australian technology business, DB Results, and take up the wellbeing app, Am I OK? to support our members, enabling individuals to regularly check in on a private and secure platform and ask the question, Am I OK? Am I OK also alerts the user when it's time to seek outside help. We thank DB Results for this opportunity to promote wellbeing and early intervention. This year, we have launched a special initiative 
the Mental Health Appeal on the 10th of October, our World Mental Health Day. Through this, we aim to raise funds for the development of a course promoting life and safety in young people. At the MHFA, we pride ourselves in making sure all of our programs are for the community and powered by the community. We have a vast growing network of multicultural ambassadors, youth ambassadors and future leaders who further the community voice in promoting mental health and well-being. Our multicultural network has inspired our educational and multicultural webinars as an initiative to assist individuals cope with success during the pandemic. I would like to take this moment to thank our board directors and patrons, scientific advisory committee members, our wonderful staff, multicultural and youth ambassadors, future leaders, MHFA members and major sponsors for their continuous support to our organization. As we continue to work to deepen understanding of the importance of mental well-being and educating the community. Let's work in solidarity for the benefit of our mental health. Thank you, Australia. Just before we um, move on to um, having anyone else up here, just want to point out today that we will be talking about obviously mental health and um, people will be sharing their stories. If there's anything within that, that triggers uh, you um, personally, please don't leave here without seeing someone else. We don't want you to leave here feeling um, any worse than what you walked in through the door. So uh, please come and see one of the organisers or myself or, some, or just the person next to you. For those people at home though too, uh, really important while you're sitting there by yourself that if there is anything that triggers you while we're having these conversations, uh, Mental Health Foundation of Australia have a line 1300 643 287. Uh, we're here to break down stigma and start talking about what's going on so if those things trigger for you, make sure you actually talk about it. Okay. I would now like to invite Kira Lee Dutton, I practiced that one as well last night, uh, a Director of Mental Health Foundation Australia to provide a welcome address. Um, but just a little bit about Kiralee. Kiralee is the Director of Mental Health Foundation Australia. In recent years, Kiralee has made a strong commitment to helping others and building stronger communities. Her primary area of focus has been issues related to the mental health and well-being of working families, children, and the education preparedness of employees from a non-English speaking background. Please welcome Ms Kiralee Dutton to the stage. Good morning everybody and welcome. On behalf of the Mental Health Foundation of Australia, I'd like to welcome you all to the Sport and Mental Health Forum. It's lovely to see so many faces here. Last year this event was almost completely virtual, so thank you so much all for coming. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are with us today. Mental health has been under-addressed in the Australian sporting landscape for far too long. However, several athletes at home and internationally have recently opened up about their battles with depression and anxiety. They've revealed their struggles with mental health, dealing with their schedules of relentless training, competition and evaluation. On behalf of the Mental Health Foundation, I'd like to warmly welcome our presenters and panel members. We are honoured to have a pre-recorded opening address from the Senator Honourable Richard Colbeck, who is the Federal Minister for Sport, Federal Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care and Services. This will be followed by our MC, Corey Sells, interviewing the wonderful Tracy Stockwell, who is a former Olympian and Vice President of Swimming Australia, and the wonderful Will Stockwell, who is an aspiring elite athlete. Then we look forward to a keynote address from Michael Dewick, who is an educational and developmental psychologist. After morning tea, we will be joined by panel members Andrew Crowell, Rachel Jones, Krishnil Mirhaj, Annie Flamsteed, and again, Michael Dewick. Um, Naz will be our panel moderator, and we'll share more details about our speakers a little bit later on in the morning. I welcome all our dig dignitaries and participants who are joining us today, including Rob Mohawk, MP, who amongst other roles is Queensland's Shadow Assistant Minister for Mental Health. Thank you for your support at this and other events. These last two years have been like unlike anything we have ever experienced or imagined. 
with COVID-19 bringing many new norms, such as social distancing, working from home, quarantining and so on, the MHFA has made sure the pandemic situation does not compromise our National Mental Health Month campaign. We've organised virtual, various virtual and physical events on many different aspects related to mental health. This year, our theme for National Mental Health Month is post-pandemic recovery and resilience. And what a relevant theme this is, considering the impact the pandemic has had and is still continuing to have on all Australians. To facilitate the task of running all these different events in 2018, the Foundation implemented our Australian Multicultural Ambassadors and Australian Youth Ambassadors programs, comprising a dedicated network of volunteers across the country. The aim was to reduce the stigma associated with, with mental health issues within culturally and linguistically diverse communities and generally within the Australian community. It is with great pride that I can now say we have a network of over 300 ambassadors across the country and I would like to particularly thank the Queensland ambassadors for their support this year. I would like to thank our patrons, our board directors, our scientific advisory committee members, multicultural ambassadors, youth ambassadors, future leaders, volunteers, well-wishers of the foundation, all for their contribution towards organising all of the events within this year's national campaign. Thank you also and a very heartfelt, very sincere and immense gratitude to Susan and Pushpa, who's hiding out the back there, for all the hard work that you've put into organising the events. Um, Susan lives south of the border, so every event has had a you know, little added element of excitement just to see whether or not Susan would actually join us. Uh, I once again thank you all for joining us today. With your support, we can achieve many great things regarding the reduction of mental health issues and the stigma that shadows them. Thank you. So, uh, Curly Mental Health Foundation Australia, on, be on behalf of them, they would like to give you this plaque. Uh, where is your plaque? No, no. sorry. <laughs> it's all right, Corey. So, I already got one. It's good. You've already got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no worries at all. Oh, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> That's all right. No worries at all. So now we would like to play an opening address from Senator the Honourable Richard Colbeck, Federal Minister. Uh, for sport and the Federal Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. Hello and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, albeit virtually. I trust that you find the information from today's Sport and Mental Health Forum valuable. Sport has always been a massive part of Australian life, but it's perhaps only in the last decade or two that the full range of benefits associated with how keeping active impacts our mental health have really been sharpened in focus. And now in the middle of a pandemic, those mental health benefits and the social connection sport provides is recognised as more important than ever. From the moment COVID-19 reached Australia and brought sport at every level to a grinding halt last year, the Australian Government has been committed to doing everything we can to support organisations to keep Australians active and engaged safely in their sport. Two important measures to guide the return to sport include the AIS framework for rebooting sport in a COVID-19 environment and Sport Australia's return to sport toolkits. This is a tough environment, but we remain committed to supporting sport through these uncertain times because we know it can play a prominent role in lifting the nation's spirit and, importantly, its recovery. We still have some way to go to restore the participation levels of pre-COVID-19, with junior sport being the most impacted. We continue focusing efforts on our National Sporting Schools program to try and keep as many children engaged in free and fun sporting opportunities and have had to adapt the way the program is delivered in these COVID-19 times. We won't let sport be lost on this generation. We've invested a $10.3 million Sport Australia participation grant program, uh, which incentivises sporting bodies to deliver community-based participation programs and helps get Australians active as communities reopen. Our 3 million volunteers are the lifeblood of community sport, which is why Sport Australia is working with Volunteering Australia 
to connect communities and bring out the best in our mental health through participation. When it comes to Australian high performance sport, the emphasis on mental health and wellbeing has never been greater. That's why the government in 2018 backed the Australian Institute of Sport with funding to enhance athlete wellbeing and engagement right across this country. We didn't envisage the environment we're in now, but the program being, programs being run have served high performance sport very well. We've shown our commitment to high performance sport by announcing that we will continue funding these enhanced athlete and wellbeing programs and engagement services through to 2024. The impact since 2018 has already been phenomenal. The AIS has established an Athlete Mental Health Advisory Committee with the involvement of the likes of Ian Thorpe and Patrick McGorry. There is now a network of more than 30 athlete wellbeing and engagement managers embedded in national sporting organisations right around the country. The AIS Mental Health Referral Network was established in 2018 which now provides free support to more than 3,000 people across high performance sport, not just athletes, but also staff and loved ones. This service saw record demand in the lead up to this year's Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games, which is a positive sign that athletes are increasingly willing to come forward and seek support when they need it. The service also played a key role in supporting our Olympians and Paralympians while they were quarantined after the Games. Tokyo was one of the most complex Olympic and Paralympic Games ever held. And we were all so proud of how our athletes performed and thrived. There is no doubt that these were the Games Australians needed. It reminded us of the power of sport to inspire. It brought an extra level of resilience to our community during challenging times. We are committed as a government to bring major sporting events to our shores because we know the influence these can have in attracting Australians to participate, which leads to a healthier, happier society. Our, rep our investment represents a golden runway of major sporting events through to the Brisbane Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2032. I look forward to seeing sport playing a pivotal role as we recover as a community from the pandemic. Thank you and enjoy the forum. Thank you so much. I'd now like to invite uh, Tracy and Will Stockwell uh, up to the stage for a conversation. This will be quite interesting actually having uh, people who have played uh, or been involved in, in sport at different ends of, um, I guess, the uh, time spectrum um, and how things uh, will progress. So while you're making your way up, the two far chairs are for you guys. I'll just read out a little bio here. One of the, uh, both of these are quite long. Um, many of you will know the achievements of Tracy Stockwell um, or Tracy Calkins. Um, she is an Olymp a US Olympic gold medalist, winning an amazing three gold medals in LA in 1984. A world championship gold medalist, to this day, Tracy has won more US national swimming titles than any other female swimmer in history. She is also the only swimmer to have won national championships and broken American records in every stroke, plus the individual medley. I'm feeling sort of rather lazy at the minute. Originally from Nashville, Tennessee, Tracy moved to Australia in 1991 after her, married, after her marriage to Olympic medalist Mark Stockwell. Tracy has worked at the Queensland Academy of Sport in several family businesses and several family businesses, including Splash Leisure. Tracy is a founding member and past president of Women's Sport Queensland, has served on the board of Queensland Events Corporation and was the chair of the Queensland Academy of, of Sport. Tracy is currently the vice president, of swimming, vice president of Swimming Australia Limited and the chair of the High Performance Committee. And Will, as you may have deduced, is the son of Tracy and Mark. At 26 years old, Will has been a competitive swimmer for eight years already. He is a national finalist in swimming in the freestyle and backstroke sprint events Will has represented Australia at two World University Games and a US Open in Sprint Freestyle events in 50 and 100 metres. We're so grateful that Will is willing to speak openly of his lived experience with, his, with the fragility of mental health. He is also keen to share the techniques and practices that he has sought out to help cope with the stresses of not only being an athlete, but also a human being. In different time frames in the same sport, we will compare the mental health pressures that Tracy and Will have experienced and how they have managed it. 
So let's uh, let's begin. They're already on. Check around. Quite interesting, I think. Uh, so Tracy, I think we'll start with yourself. Um, your career spanning the 70s and 80s, um, the external uh, environment was obviously different to what it is now, um, and yet some of the same pressures would have existed to, to um, excel and succeed and, and all those sorts of things. What pressures did you experience on your mental wellbeing when you were competing at the elite, uh, elite level? Um, and some of those might have been your own expectations of, of yourself, but also from external um, individuals or, or environments. Yeah, thanks, Corey. And just I'd like to commend um, Mental Health Foundation Australia for including sport in this. It's been a big part of my life and I'm quite passionate. And I think Kira Lee is, and, and maybe the minister as well said that um, we haven't talked about it enough, uh, mental health in general, but also in relation to sport. So very happy to be here. Um, very different environment now, uh, now than when I was competing in the 70s and 80s. Obviously, there was no 24-hour media cycle. There was no social media. Um, there wasn't much conversation about mental health. Um, a lot of the conversation in sport was about sports psychology, about relaxation, about meditation, about visualization from a performance point of view. But nobody ever really talked about when things didn't go well or um, when there were challenges. Um, I was pretty lucky um, that I didn't have a lot of um, low points of, of my career and um, thankfully was able to realise my dreams. But um, one, one experience I did have, and I guess my pres the pressure that I felt was probably more put on my, by myself. Um, being from Nashville, Tennessee, swimming wasn't very popular and we barely got much in the media, maybe a little bit of a section in the sports pages um, every, you know, every other year maybe from when there was major international competitions. Um, so my husband and I often say, gee, I'm glad we didn't compete now. I mean, I think it'd be much more challenging with the, with the challenges that the young people have today in particular. But um, one example where I did have external and felt external pressures was in 1980, the US boycotted the Olympic Games. And we held our Olympic trials and nationals after the Olympics had taken place in Moscow. And at that meet, they put the medal winning times up on the scoreboard and the pressure to beat those times, even though those competitors weren't next to you, was, was really um, strong. And I put a lot of pressure on myself. And, you know, I did, did well, but I think in the outcome was I would have won five silver medals. But, I mean, you don't know if you were there next uh, to a I, Russian... I a Russian and a German or whatever, but you don't know what might have happened. But in one event, which was not an Olympic event, I actually did a personal best time, an American record, and the pressure wasn't on to perform. So I think my best event was there. And I think when I think back, I go, I bet I did better in that event because there wasn't this pressure and this expectation to beat those times. Mm -hmm. And I think... I didn't know it at the time, but when I look back, the, it did affect my mental health not going to the Olympics in 1980, and that's why last year I was very concerned for the athletes when the Tokyo Games got postponed, mm -hmm. um, having experienced missing a Games, and I was just so hopeful that we didn't miss those and very grateful that, that the athletes were able to compete and Tokyo did a brilliant job in what was a very different game. So um, I guess I put more pressure on myself and there wasn't a lot of external pressures. There was expectations, I guess, from my coach. Um, but I think it's much different today. Yeah. It's interesting you say that you are lucky uh, to be successful in your career. I call that hard work. But, um, uh, Will, I guess we mentioned that uh, just now about the, the advent of media is everywhere now. And, and I guess the biggest difference in my mind um, from when Tracy went through um, all those uh, elite times to now is social media. You know, it's in our face, it's everywhere, um, very hard to escape. How does that influence uh, your mental health when you're striving to, re to reach these elite levels um, with the, the constant feedback, both positive and negative? We can have, a, a, have it both ways. Um, and, and what do you focus on more? Is it more the, the stinging comments or is it more the... The other comments so how does that affect you mate yeah i mean 
with socials, it's it is what it is, and it's and it's here to stay. I think, and it's um, it can be a really positive tool. I think if you use it, if you use it well. Um, me personally, I have I've set some boundaries around it and have to switch off if I notice myself scrolling too much. Or can you um, explain that? So just yeah. explain those boundaries for me. Yeah, I mean, it's with technology, you can always just turn it off. It's um, that's the way I look at it, and it is healthy to kind of use it intermediately like I'll, I'll use it for a bit come off it and just check in with myself um with me i can you can find yourself wasting a lot of time on it and mm. um energy that can be used elsewhere yeah. you know with having helping you know other people or um training or mm. or just any relationship that you have um mm. i think yeah it's it's just it can be a big waste of time, but the good parts of it are things like this, um, sharing information and um, getting your messages across quite easily to a large group of people. Before we move on from that, have you had any experience with, um, I guess, trolls or, or people who have yeah. attached you on social media? Not really. I just no. see it. Um, I'm, I'm quite, I'm pretty quiet on socials. <laughs> um, good job. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's... For me, I know, I know it. I know some people use it um, as a positive. Like I have some some friends who are swimmers who um, who do use comments and stuff like that as a positive um, motivator. Positive motivator. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, trolling. I think trolling and swimming's pretty quiet. Um, yeah, unless there's some controversy around it. Um, yeah, I think Kate Campbell came out a while ago um, about the negativity on social media and did a really nice piece on that. And then she's more recently come mm. out about her own mental health challenges and been very mm. open about that, which I thought was a very positive mm. um, step. But um, I think elite athletes are out there and I think one of her points was they're having a go and you trolls, you know, you're not, you know, at least we're up there trying to get the best out of ourselves and do something positive and inspirational and, um, and you know, and um, so I think she's put it, dealt with it and now, mm. like mm. Will, I think, trying not to get too caught up in it. Mm. I guess it's contingent on your own mindset and how those comments affect you, isn't it, really? Mm. Um, Tracy, another one for you. We, we hear a lot of elite athletes and I think this is um, particularly prevalent for swimmers and runners in, in, um, in my, I guess, talking to sports um, athletes, are uh, hyper-focusing on minuscule changes to shave off like, the tiniest of margins to gain sometimes a thousandth of a second. And that pressure's on to do that because um, a friend of mine's son missed out on the Commonwealth Games by two hundredth of a, of a second. With such a hyper-focus on tiny changes in the pool, so making minute changes to strokes or or um, you know, race strategy. Were there times in your personal life where that hyper focus came off your, your swimming performance in the pool to maybe relationships or business or, or um, family life? Or you know, did you end up hyper focusing on other things? Look, probably not hyper focusing, but I think sport did teach me a lot of skills um, to about communication and about doing your best and setting goals and, and giving 100% and things that we've tried to, um, to hard work and teamwork and working together, which we've tried to instill in our kids. Um, but I would say, no, I am not a perfectionist or not hyper vigilant on little details. My children might argue that I'm, I'm at sometimes maybe a little. She's um, good. Control, <laughs> controlling, but I try to be um, chilled, but I use the skills from sport to help me in my everyday life, whether it is business or relationships. Um, but in sport, it is those minute one percenters that make the difference that you do have to um, concentrate on. So I just try to look at it as using the positives um, towards getting the best out of myself and, and my family and my business. And yeah. again, it's like that mindset, isn't it? Where they're using it for a positive and negative. Will, um, Probably extending from that, you, you are in a bit of a rarefied situation where both of your parents have been Olympic uh, swimmers. Um, and does that create any extra pressure for you? And, and again, whether that's your own um, feelings of that or whether that's perceived pressure from outside. Yeah, I can't speak on um, 
perceived pressures from other people. Um, I don't really take much notice to that, but I, as an adult, no, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me at all. Um, I think it used to when I was a young adult trans, um, you know, transferring from school into what I wanted to do after school. Um, in saying that, I think I've been quite lucky that I do love the sport and um, I, don't, I don't compete in the sport to, uh, for, for medals or anything like that. I do it for enjoyment. Um, I like the challenge, uh, the lessons that you learn from failure, failures um, and riding the highs and lows. Um, so, yeah, not, I don't feel pressure from my parents both being Olympic swimmers, um, although I, I do have to say I probably did feel that when I was a young adult around 17, 18, um, just because your whole life, like we were talking before, your whole life you've played this role of um, as the child and kind of um, impressing or wanting, wanting validation from your parents a bit. Um, and I'm definitely a people pleaser and uh, so I did feel like looking back on it, looking back on it, um, yeah, there was that, even though there was no pressure from my parents directly, it was just my own um, influence that I was having on myself. So, yeah. Okay. Probably other people had that expectation. Oh, yeah. well, you're going to be a good swimmer because your mum and dad were yeah, good Yeah, there's definitely been that, but I don't take notice of it. I, it's yeah. always, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's always been about... Um, hard work and smart work and no shortcuts and um mm. yeah genetics do help i think but um yeah yeah i guess um i'm adding a question in here that yeah. we spoke about a little bit earlier from the other side of that uh tracy uh, i've been president of a pretty club and coached um you know teams myself and i've seen parents who have been overbearing um particularly I think when they haven't played the sport before and they seem to think they know what they're talking about. Um, but, and I like Brene Brown's take on this, as we spoke about before, where the, rather than the helicopter parent, it's the lawnmower parent, so preparing the path for the child rather than preparing the child for the path. Um, you're also in that rarefied position, and, and yourself and your husband, where you've understood the, the highs and lows and the pitfalls and where things could go, could go right or wrong. Um, how did you handle that, knowing those things, but allowing Will, sorry to talk about you in the third person, mate, right. <laughs> um, allowing Will to be able to go through that process himself without being that helicopter or lawn old parent that we're talking about? I think it's much harder being a parent um, of, of an athlete than being an athlete yourself um, and having that little bit of knowledge that Mark and I do have and the experience that we do have. Um, I guess... Fortunately, I mean, Will came to swimming a little bit later and he made the choice himself as a young adult um, that this is what he wanted to do and we were very pleased um, for him and it had to be his decision um, and we, I think, allowed him to have that decision. Um, I think somebody gave me some advice one time because then, you know, driving home from the game or the sport with your child, you know, what do you say, what do you say? And, and somebody gave me the advice of saying, you know, don't try to debrief, you're not the coach, you know, they've got their coach. Um, but to say, gee, I enjoyed watching you play mm. today, or gee, I enjoyed watching you swim or compete today, um, which, and, and, or that was a really good effort. I mean, applauding the effort and, and just the enjoyment of being there to support them. So I think for all of our children, we've tried to um, be there to support and it's, you know, support their decisions. And, um, and I often say, it's probably harder for my husband who was a sprinter like Will um, and, you know, has in that, you know, a little bit of testosterone there and, um, I often say, you know, I just love him and, and support him. Um, and if he wants to ask me, you know, what did you do when you had this experience or have you ever felt like this, you know, be there, but let it be driven from him. I think it's a little harder for my husband. Um, and it, as a parent, you care so much and you want the best for your kids. And when things don't go well for them or they have a hurdle or stumble, you know, it's, it's you know, you you feel for them mm. and you know until you're a parent you you know you won't appreciate that but um so we just try to support the best we can i will add on to that i think um yeah mum's right 
dad has given me a lot of knowledge in the sport, but there does come a point where um, I think parents have to put away their expertise and pride because as as young adults or adolescents, kids don't listen to their parents anyway. So <laughs> um, there's no point. Um, so just let it's it's important for the for and what I've found it's important for me to make my own mistakes and mm. um, I don't actually learn until I'm hundred um, percent in control of my own mistakes and um, yeah it's even harder if you if you fall on someone else's um, advice or something but it's 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 okay I find it's a lot better um, for the learning process if you mm. if you hundred percent own your decision or hundred percent own whatever you've um what you've done and absolutely yeah. well, i think it's a really important message uh for parents and i, I explained to you guys earlier that you know, i've been coaching football sides a couple of times i've had we sent give a message to a child and, and they uh or, or a player and they're not um producing that game plan and then when we've spoken to them afterwards i say you know what doing that and you're listening to your parent from the sideline they say yeah but you don't have to get in the car and drive home with him so i think it's really important for uh, a lesson from yourself who who has been at that elite level to let go a little bit and, and let that process happen. It's hard, it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to skip forward uh, a couple of things. I'm going to go back to the question about coaching in a minute. But, Will, you were really keen to take part in this in this forum. Um, and how do you feel about speaking about your own mental health through your progression through sport and, and just in life in general, mate? You know, Can you share with us a little bit about... Um, some of the things that you've had to deal with perhaps and, and then how you've dealt with those things and the, and the coping mechanisms you've put in place to, to deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a happy athlete is always a, a faster athlete or a better, can train better or compete better. And um, over the past couple of years, just um, coming to terms with my own anxiety and um, just how the symptoms of anxiety manifest in the body are, are, have really been a wake up call for me. Um, and I was saying as before, it's like a bit of a smack in the face to go get some help. And, um, so I was lucky enough to kind of feel those and realize, Oh, Hey, I, I, I actually do need some help here. And, um, I do really have a lovely supporting and understanding network around me, um, with friends and parents and, um, partner and, um, and they can help for, for a while and then um, but it was really important for me to go get professional help as well um, and just a little background on my mental health yeah just just having anxiety attacks with a with a real wake was the real wake-up call for me and um, having it manifest physically and you know getting sick and um, yeah having appendicitis and um, IBS and things like that and having that gut brain um, connection yeah. is a real telltale sign that yeah something's going on and I mean you can ignore it for a while but when you have those physical um, physical manifestations it's 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 a it was a big wake-up call for me so <clears throat> can I ask you and this is really important for um, for everybody but particularly young people your age who uh, you said it was a smack in the face and you and you realised you had to ask for help. How did that happen? How did you come to that decision and, and what were the words you, you yeah. used to do that? Yeah, um, I think firstly, uh, I have a really understanding partner and would, would talk to her um, and she's quite supportive, but it is really important to get that outside perspective. Um, also, I talked to... There was a pathway um, with swimming. I talked to Mark Knowles, who was the... Um, athlete well-being um, officer for swimming and the QAS um, and he put me in touch with um, uh, Michelle Mitchell who was the AIS uh, I believe she was the AIS uh, well-being manager for, for athletes as well and she works um, closely with Surfing Australia um, down the coast so I had a few really good conversations with her about um, what I was going through and the people who I should see and then um, started seeing a sports psychologist, um, but mostly talked about personal issues um, because most of the issues that I was having was stemming from my personal life, not sporting. Um, and then I was introduced to things like meditation, mindfulness, um, uh, 
uh, and that seemed to help a lot um, and just kind of calmed the storm um, really well. And then, and then what really helped was getting um, some therapy from a um, psychologist and um, working on behaviours and um, having a psychologist challenge me as well. And I think having a good therapist is really important and there's probably a lot of, mm. you know, it's, it's important that not every therapist will um, connect with you and it's okay to change. Yeah, and, absolutely. It's um, a great message. Thank yeah. you for saying that. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people and there's... Um, great data that was just released recently that I think 42% of males that go to the uh, counsellors don't go back after the first session. Yeah. That's it. So it's, it's yeah. really important. Um, if we've got a time for a couple more, uh, I'll just sneak in a couple more and... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, Are we hungry? <laughs> He's we always fast. hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, going back to techniques, I know for me, I use uh, and have done for many, many years since um, since rehabilitation, uh, cold water therapy. I know that's not going to be an issue for you because you're going in the pool every day at 4 What are some of the, I know you mentioned meditation, but what are some of the other coping te techniques that you've used, particularly if you can see the signals coming mm. for, um, or the feeling coming of an anxiety attack? Mm. Mm. What are those coping mechanisms mm. that you use? I mean, luckily I've only had a few anxiety attacks. Um, well, prominent ones. Um, yeah, I love uh, Wim Hof and cold yeah. therapy and everything. Uh, that's kind of what I started on, <laughs> I think. And then I um, uh, use, I was first introduced, like in meditation was introduced to yoga nidra, which was um, quite important with my sleep and just calming my nervous system before bed. Um, and then I was, I can't remember who introduced um, Sam Harris's waking up app to me, and I heard you can you know get a get a free membership if you if you are struggling financially, which I was. So um, that's been a really de uh, daily tool that I do use, and it's just in, it's great to kind of start your day with some meditation, mm. um, even if it is ten minutes, and just checking in um, and just being present. And I feel like being present is the biggest thing um, that can combat that anxiety. Um, what else is there? Yeah, uh, they're, they're probably the, the main, main ones, ones and, yeah. and, and therapy as well and just talking to a therapist um, and getting things off your chest but also, like I said, with anxiety you do obsess about things or mm. um, and it is important to have a therapist that can challenge you and not just like play into your vic victim behaviour or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. If, if, if I do feel like um, some things are arising, I'll just give my therapist a call and get an appointment. Or, or, um, and get meditate. onto it quicker, like rather yeah. than, and I'm a, I was, when I was a young person, my family, you know, it was all harden up, get on with it, you know, suck it up and go. And, and so you just suppress some of those mm. feelings and then they build up and they build up. And so I think it's great that you're realizing and recognizing those triggers or signals. Um, and I like the importance of, of, um, you know, having a counsellor or a psychologist is a very personal thing. And yep. at Swimming Australia, we have um, athlete wellbeing that Minister Colbeck mentioned, and we have um, uh, we've had one um, person in that space, but now have another person. Um, he mentioned the AIS um, mental health network referral system, mm -hmm. which is a free service for categorised athletes around the country. And I think last year referrals jumped 30% when Tokyo was postponed um, and now they're still quite high, I think because of the pandemic mm. and, and things like that. So I think it's great to have a network um, because it is a personal thing and you need to get the right kind of support that helps you. Absolutely. I promise I'll finish shortly, Susan. Um, I guess I'm gonna finish off on a couple of questions here, but I, uh, I think influential people around us have uh, have the ability to have huge impacts both positively and negatively and i think from an elite sport actually from any sports person whether it's grassroots or elite um coaches and mentors play a huge part of of um how we feel about ourselves and our performance and then life in general after that what do you feel tracy is um the role of a coach nowadays back from from then it was very different uh and what i mean by coach though if I talk to Andrew, we were talking to Andrew earlier about there's the head coach, then there's assistant coach, then there's line coaches, you know, um, nutritionists, 
there's a plethora of people around now that all have that mentoring role. How significant is their role? And are, do you think we're giving those coaches enough education around this sort of information to be able to handle their athletes? Look, I think it's improved a lot. Um, I, I think I was fortunate to have some great coaches, some very intuitive and, and some that I was very trusting and we had a great relationship and therefore I think you could talk about many things. Um, but I think um, it's, it's an ongoing thing and we're never done with that education. Um, I think at Swimming Australia, I think our head coach, you know, visits many of our programs of where our high performance athletes are and if they are sensing you know, some, some issues or some development that needs to occur. I think, you know, we try to support that. Um, but I think it's about the athlete and the coach having a trusting relationship where they can communicate well. Um, but it, the role of the coach is, is not just to physically prepare the athlete, it's to, pro, you know, give that program, but also to mentally um, prepare and emotionally support um, their athletes. So it's a very important role and we, and, and we take that quite seriously that we need to continue to educate because I think we can do better. We've done, we're doing better, but I think we can always do better. So what do you, how does that happen? How do we do better? I think it's having the conversations. It's, well, I'm happy for you to yeah, answer Yeah, we'll that. jump in. Yeah, I was going to say coaches almost need a, a, a year of like some sort of psychology diploma or something. Just the, uh, the best coaches that I've had are really understanding um, and they can read athletes really well. And as I said earlier, a happy athlete and a mentally, mentally well athlete is a better athlete, so it's in their best interest. Um, not only just to get their athlete to perform, but just as a good human being. Um, as of, yeah, I, I, there, are, there are some coaches that, that do struggle. Um, but yeah, coaching's, I think, more of that high level. Um, athlete management. management athlete management, yeah. yeah. And I think that's across, uh, whether it's grassroots now or, or yeah. LA, it's, it's really about understanding. We'll finish off with that one. That, what's that? Uh, we'll finish off with that one there. Now I do know, I've got this one right, there are plaques here for you guys. I really want to say thank you um, for both of you to come up here and share your experiences, particularly yourself, Will. It's, it's uh, immensely important for um, people to hear uh, other stories um, and mental health impacts uh, a lot of people, um, but it's really important for, for young men to be starting to stand up and talk about this stuff and, and that stoicism that is killing many, many people around this country and around the world, once we start to cut through that, we will start to save a lot more lives. So don't ever underestimate the power of what you're uh, doing here and speaking about these things and sharing your story, mate. It's, uh, it's um, amazing and a very brave thing to do. Yeah, to, thank you. Very happy to. Okay, so uh, now we'd like to invite Michael Duhigg to, uh, for a keynote address. Uh, and while you're on your way up, Michael, I'll uh, run through your little bio here. Michael is an educational and development, developmental psychologist plying his trade across both public and private settings at the Queensland Children's Hospital and Maverick Psychology, respectively. Michael is an active researcher, having published several scientific uh, articles ranging from trauma and early psychosis to medicinal cannabis with many articles also presented to national and international audiences. Michael is also the chair of the College of Educational and Developmental Psychologists Queensland and holds various panel positions across Queensland Health and Queensland University of Technology. I think I'm a busy man, mate. Uh, please welcome Michael to the stage. Thank you so much. Um, 
I realise I'm between us and morning tea, so I'm going to try and make this educational and efficient at the same time. That's all right, that's all right. Um, so when the Foundation first reached out to ask me to present today, I really jumped at the chance to combine, I guess, my two passions being um, sport and mental health. Um, Corey, I think what you said before about filling your soul, this is sort of the, the realm for me. So um, a little bit about me, I wear a couple of hats. Like I said, like Corey said before, I'm an Edinburgh psych by trade. Um, I'm also the CRM for the Centre for Clinical Trials in Rare Neurodevelopmental Disorders. It's a bit of a mouthful. We really tried to shorten that, but we couldn't come up with anything fancy. Um, and I know the team are logged on to this morning, so a big shout out and hello to them. Um, I run a private practice on the north side of Brisbane, and I'm also, uh, like Corey said, uh, involved at UQ. So um, this is me trying not to get belted um, playing for the Philippines, which is my mother's country of birth back in 2012. Um, we ended up winning uh, the Division One in Asia uh, for the Philippines, so we're super ecstatic. Uh, the following year, we were humbled by Japan in our first match, 121 nil, and we held the record for the worst international loss for about four years. But I'm still proud of you know where we've come from. <laughs> um, so just with some um, some housekeeping with my role at the Children's Hospital there, um, we collaborate with a number of I guess pharmaceutical sponsors uh, with that work. So. I have not received any direct funding from the companies listed below. However, we do participate as a site for their sponsored clinical trials via the CCT R&D. Um, just before we, kick, we, we go one further, in terms of today's presentation, I guess we, I want to make a bit of a distinction between um, the difficulties athletes may face you know, into retirement and post-sport versus those that they face while they're still competing and still in that limelight. I think that's a whole different conversation and we know that there are, you know, rates there that are comparable to the general population and even sort of increased in terms of, I guess, some of the, the weight and, and image and body image concerns. But today I'll just be speaking about the difficulties into that retirement phase. Um, so to set the scene a little bit, I'd like you guys to think about you know, if there's anyone, obviously we've got two great sports people uh, in the audience today, how, you know, someone you may know may have reached that elite athlete level. And you think about it, my um, experiences with rugby union, so lots of my content will be rugby today, sorry about that. Um, but you think about, you know, through schoolboy level, under 15s, under 16s, under 17s, you know, kids that are good at rugby per se, they're tapped on the shoulder, uh, they might have conversations, they might get a free bag, you know, a, a nice singlet and that sort of thing, and they're kind of involved within these systems very early on. And those systems kind of, you know, look at their progress as an, as an athlete, you know, are they putting on weight, are they training, are they, you know, doing those right things to sort of reach that next level. Um, and during that time, they might progress from that schoolboy school arena into cults or, you know, Australian schoolboys or whatnot. Um, and during that time, I guess their progress is being tracked. And over that progress being tracked, if they're still excelling and doing a great job, then hopefully they go on to make a debut or a similar, you know, entering a, a Commonwealth Games, an Olympic Games, a major championship, depending on your sport. So you can see with the transition into professional sport, there's lots of scaffolding. There's lots of multiple players, there's lots of multiple stakeholders, and they're all working off that same hymn sheet for the benefit of the athlete, which is brilliant, don't get me wrong. But then we get to the point of today's conversation, and it's transitioning out of professional sport. And you can see there that obviously we have retirement, and then we've got lots of question marks. What happens next? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, retirement's impacted by a handful of factors. We think about, you know, uh, is it a choice? Are you going to go out on top and win a championship and have that trophy uh, and that sort of thing, or is it forced? You know, have you been um, injured and it's something that it was unexpected? Have you been going through some poor form and that next contract's not there? So retirement can be compact, uh, compounded by a number of things, so that's something to be mindful of. What we know clinically, I guess, is also that transition periods are always tricky. And I think, um, Will, you touched on it yourself when you sort of exited that high school arena, then embarking on your career. You know, those transition points are always tricky. And we see this clinically. We think about primary school to high school, some of those mental health concerns pop up for our young people. High school into the big bad world, that also is another sticking point. Um, and you think about, you know, developmental milestones. You think about puberty for young people and that sort of thing. Mental health can always be impacted by these transition points. So if we know that's the issue uh, with our transitioning to retirement, I think that you know, we can be doing a better job about that. Uh, again, rugby. <laughs> so uh, this fellow is Shane Williams. He played on the wing uh, for the Welsh International Rugby Union team 
um, he holds the try scoring record uh, for their national team. And here he says, I've spoken to a lot of lads that have, ha uh, that have really struggled and at times been in dark places. Some of them are still struggling five to ten years after retiring. As a sport, we need to look out for each other a lot more. So, I mean, these are really wise words. Um, Shane retired in 2014. This quote is from two weeks ago. So you can see how such a vast period of time is still, you know, passed, but the impact of retiring and coming out of the limelight is still, you know, impacting himself and, you know, some of his colleagues there. Even, I guess I'll, I'll talk about identity and the loss of in a little bit, but even when I was putting this slide together, I was like, well, how do I introduce Shane? Do I just call him Shane? Do I say, you know, retired international rugby union player? So that's something just to be mindful of moving forward. All right, the fun stuff. Who knows what this is? The psychologist, you're not allowed to answer. Yeah, what is it? Beautiful, now I played hooker back in the day. <laughs> Boom, lovely. Um, what is it used for? Who said that? Yep, yeah, sorry, what would you say? Motivation. Perfect, catch. Lovely, <laughs> good job, perfect. Yes, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it's one of the most commonly used frameworks to work out why we get out of bed in the morning, you know, why we are motivated to do what we do. So if you think about, I guess we go from a bottom-up process here, um, and the impact, I guess, professional sport or elite sport plays on our hierarchy of needs, you can see, I guess, sport impacts all of them. You can think about our psych uh, physiological needs there. If you're a professional sports person, um, and that's the way that money ends up in your, bank, in your bank account. That takes care of food, water, warmth and rest. Um, your safety needs are satisfied because, you know, hopefully you're earning enough money that if something happens and, you know, there's a blip on the radar, you've got enough savings there, so it provides that security. Um, it also provides you some, you know, emotional well-being. It, it gives you a gym membership by being a professional athlete so you can get in there and, and get that mental health fix and those dopamine and those serotonin receptors go up. Belongingness and love needs, so that third tier there. Um, this for me really stands out with my, I guess, my lived experience of, of playing uh, rugby, but also my training as a psychologist. You know, I, I would, we're based in the Philippines, I'd be in camp with these boys for two weeks, but, you know, if one of them said I'm getting married in, on the other side of the world, there would be no hesitation. And like, I'd only met him two days ago. It's just that shared experience and how um, that belongingness, we, like we're all in the same hymn sheet, we're all you know, coming from, for the Philippines, the same background. So for professional athletes, you know, did you meet your significant other via your sport? Did you guys train together? Um, you know, your place amongst your squad, you know, those, those, those 25, 30, depending on your, your squad number, those, those teammates, like that's an intimate relationship. You're potentially spending more time with them than your significant other during the week. If you're touring with them, that's definitely the case. And then esteem needs, so in the blue in the middle there, you can see how, you know, sport um, really plays a role with, those with the feeling of prestige and, and feeling of accomplishment. You know, this is in the NRL system making the top 25. Um, in, in a team, this is starting instead of being on the bench. Um, this is getting, you know, a player's player, an MVP award. That feeling of esteem really gets triggered from sport there. And obviously the top, the self-actualisation, so that's reaching your full potential. So you think about how sport plays a role with this in terms of, you know, maybe it's winning an Olympic medal, maybe it's winning a major championship, maybe it's winning an NRL premiership, so that, that kind of feeling that you get from, you know, putting all your effort into something and it coming off and you getting those accolades and, and really feeling good about the, you know, what you've achieved. If you think about how sport impacts this for our sports people, you can see that it really leaves us vulnerable in retirement. Because all of these levels, all of these cups are being filled by that one particular thing. So in retirement we can see that, you know, I'm no longer Michael the, the psychologist, I'm just Michael. And that really relates to that loss of identity. So I would challenge all of you to think about, you know, meeting new people at a dinner party, you know, even ourselves coming together today, hi I'm Michael, I'm a psychologist. You know, your identity is always synonymous with how you speak to people and how you introduce yourself. So for our sports people transitioning out of the limelight, that's something that they really find difficult. So we find that loss of identity is kind of the thing that hits them the most. And there is a term coined uh, a foreclosed identity, which I think you know, is synonymous with things like this. That's where people think they know who they are, but they're yet to explore other options. And I think that's a really good way of summing up potentially a an elite athlete transitioning out of that limelight. 
So like I said before, why does it hit hard? We've spoken about that loss of identity. Um, you think about your diminished social network. So if you're in a team, sport or an organisation, you know, you're rolling in Monday to Saturday, Monday to Sunday with the same group of people, you know, enjoying that time, you know, having a laugh, getting your work done and then, you know, going for coffee afterwards, etc. You know, in that retirement phase, there's no longer that opportunity there. There's no longer that network there. So that, that also hits hard. A tricky one here is that lack of routine and sort of the biological mechanisms that that will involve. You think about some of these, I guess, elite sportsmen that were picked up quite young in those schoolboy systems, etc. They've been kind of taught or well told what to eat, how much to sleep, when to do rehab. You know, their lives have particularly been scaffolded from you know when they've made that entrance into that sport. So, coming at the other end and now not having that person to really help you all that plan to be like, well, this is what I'm doing Monday, this is what I'm doing Tuesday, sometimes can be really daunting. Yeah? Others may love that. Others may love that flexibility. We, ju we just don't know. And sort of the biological impacts of that, you know, getting in the gym, you know, lifting, getting around with your mates and, and how that really impacts you biologically. Now that you don't have that opportunity and you don't have those, I guess, those bits and pieces to fill your cup up will impact you and your mental health. So when you pull this all together, you look at you know, what we're working from and that's kind of a blank slate. So you finish that chapter of life and now you're on to that new one. What does that look like? Um, and you, know, you might have been playing this sport since you were five, six years old and now you've come out the other end, you know, mid thirties, late thirties, forties. I mean, if you play golf, you can keep going. That's lovely about golf. Um, but you're now working from a blank slate, you know, a lot deeper into life, which is sometimes you know, really tricky. So, you know, as a good psychologist, we're not going to leave it there. Like, here's your problems, that's it, see you later. Uh, we're going to do something about it. So, this is, I guess, I, I like to categorise them into, like, two distinct areas. Again, we're going to think about how we can make sure that we can scaffold some of those shifts in identity, and then also what we can do to sort of buffer or mitigate some of those mental health concerns. Um, so it's really pleasing to hear that there's kind of those welfare managers and those sorts of people getting involved, which is lovely, I guess, during, but I'd really love to see, you know, either that person or, or someone else to be employed with that transition sort of out to retirement and, and what that person would do. So I've just got some dot points there and this is, you know, um, me thinking out aloud of what this person may do and, and how it may help people. And, you know, that sort of transition manager would, you know, be a standard part of the organisation. You've got your, your head coach, your assistant coaches, your SNC, your sports psych um, and a transition manager. And they'd sort of be tasked with educating the playing group about life after sport. So obviously we would try and plan this well in advance to that retirement phase um, and looking at what, you know, the pathways are there for athletes. Um, and connecting that athlete with the relevant stakeholders. Do they want to go into tertiary education? Do we need to think about university? Do they want to go off and get a trade? Do they want to go off into business? Is there a, you know, a mentor that we can look at uh, in our networks that we can get this athlete aligned with? Um, we'd also look at sort of pre implementing some predetermined reviews. So whether this be 36, 24, 12, six months out until retirement, if, if we sort of you know, know when we're going to pull the pin, that would be lovely. And then, like I said before, those transition points are always difficult, so we, we're just trying to minimise the impact of that transition. Um, and ideally, they'd still be tasked with the transition into retirement from the support organisation. So, you know, what are the private psychologists you guys have within your networks, your psychiatrists, your medical teams, etc. Um, and then thinking about the next year, so not the new year, the next year, you've still got those skills from professional sport. So we need to plan for transitions into retirement by looking at what the next chapter for you looks like. And obviously this is, will be a, a horses for courses type thing, very subjective. So, you know, a, as a psychologist or as a counsellor, looking at, you know, asking the athlete, um, what do they love about their sport or sport in general? Um, is there an opportunity that uh, we can use that to their advantage and look at a career path that way? You know, what else do they like doing outside of sport? Um, what skills has sport taught them and are they transferable? Well, I definitely think things like work ethic, timetabling, organisation that we, you know, all these professional sports people do is, is you know, they're great life skills. Um, one of the strategies we use to do this is looking at, you know, where they see themselves in five to ten years and then also reverse engineering. So very similar how you would plan, I guess, uh, a 12 month NRL premiership, you know, stint or an AFL premiership stint or a four year Olympic program. Well, what are we doing now so that in four years time I know what I'm going to, you know, look what my chapter is going to look like down the track. So programming and, and, and implementing those short term and long term goals and modifying them as per you would do as an elite athlete. 
Um, and then, yeah, that last one down the bottom, uh, very important. Like sport, life always doesn't go to plan. You know, COVID last year, for example, in the foundation and doing these sorts of bits and pieces. So in sport, you know, we're talking injuries, lacks of form, maybe a contract fell through, etc. So just like life, we have to be flexible enough to just roll with those punches and then keep progressing towards our goal. So that's about the identity. And the next slide is just looking at the mental health. So um, the support team, and Will, I think you touched on this as well, mate, so well done. Looking at you know, who your support team is when you get into that retirement phase. Is it your direct family? Is it your significant other? Uh, are they there for you? Of course they will be, but they may not have the professional expertise to help you with those really pointy occasions. Um, your trusted friends and your social networks. Um, your organisation support team, so I think that you know, in, in the NRL, I think for medical coverage, they actually give you two years post-retirement for any sort of physical um, type presentation you may have. I'm not sure about the mental health aspect. Um, are there mentors that you regular see, regularly see inside or outside your organisation and how do we continue that relationship? And then, um, like I said before, the primary care professionals. So are you consulting with a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a social worker privately, external to your organisation, that we can do a nice handover with them when you get into that retirement phase. And then, like I said, the social network. So, you know, um, do you have a great relationship with a handful of guys that are also in that retirement phase that you guys meet up for coffees and try and really, I guess, mimic those social opportunities that you had while still competing now in that retirement phase? Have you joined a gym? Have you got in touch with those guys and, and sort of made those different connections and, and you know, organise those catch-ups so you can still say within those no social networks? And then obviously, last but not least, the contingency plan. So how do we know when to step up um, or sit back and wait to support you? So pre-planned retirement checkpoints, you know, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months into retirement, and looking at how you're doing, what's going on. Because sometimes that can be just like the, the, the perfect segue to a conversation that I'm not doing well. Um, completion of validated measures. I think we're talking before about using the DAS you know, there's so many different ways we can do that now with, you know, technology, et cetera, and really getting an objective bird's eye view of how the athlete's going into retirement and then if we need to intervene or not. And then obviously identifying the threshold for implementing support plans. So, Will, again, you said things around, like, manifesting those, those symptoms physically. That's when I, that was the trigger I needed to do something about it. It'll be different for everyone, so maybe some people it'll be like, well, you know, I'm drinking way too much. That's when I need to get some support or, you know, my sleep is terrible. I need to seek some support from that. So working out what the thresholds are there. And then understanding what your options are during that retirement phase. You know, are you linked in with um, your organisation and they're going to provide you that support post-playing uh, post into retirement? Um, are you a part of a private healthcare fund? Do you know that you can see your GP to get a mental health treatment plan and that will give you sessions with a psychologist at a subsidised rate? They're also the educational things that we need to make sure that, you know, our athletes into retirement are aware of. And then, yeah, like I said, last but not least, understanding that it took a long period of time to write your athletic chapter. You know, we're talking years, decades, if not two. Um, so the next chapter will be much the same, but hopefully it'll last a lot longer than your athletic endeavours. So a massive thank you for having me here today. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation um, and I can see morning tea from here. Thank you. <laughs> Again, Michael, and we do have a plaque for Michael as well. Um, just appreciation for, for doing this today, mate, and My pleasure. your uh, knowledge. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. So we were going to be stopping for quite a bit of a networking uh, tea and coffee break, but um, I took up a lot of time. <laughs> so could everyone just go and grab a, a tea or a coffee and come back to your chairs? And, uh, and we'll go from there and we'll do our networking afterwards. Thanks very much. We'll be back in three, four, five minutes.
Today's uh, panel moderator, Naz Ravi. I actually met Naz up at the Brisbane Lions uh, a little while ago. His main job is diversity sports coordinator for Multicultural Australia. However, as an accredited exercise scientist and a highly motivated individual, uh, he is also involved in part-time leadership and an analyst role with Griffith University, Sport Corps and Brisbane Roar FC. And he's just told me he is now also pursuing a master's in high performance sport at ACU. Uh, again, I thought I was a busy man, but this guy's out of control. Um, uh, he's also, um, Naz also devotes time to Mental Health Foundation Australia's deputy leader of the Queensland Multicultural Ambassador Team. So welcome up to the stage, Naz. Thanks so much. Thanks for that, Corey. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I'll get straight into it, just being conscious of time. I'll start introducing our panel members uh, one by one. Uh, our first panelist is uh, a keynote speaker who have just heard, Michael Duhigg, an educational and de developmental psychologist you met earlier. So thank you again, Michael, if you wanted to make, you up, make your way up the stage. Our next panel member is Andrew Crowell, um, he has spent over 20 years in the AFL industry after being drafted by the Adelaide Crows in the year 2000. After four years and 44 games as a senior player, Andrew continued his journey in the AFL industry by taking on a role working with homeless youth as a project manager at the AFL Players Charity Ladder. In 2015, Andrew was employed as regional manager at the AFL Players Association, working closely with AFL clubs to refine and enhance personal development and well-being programs offered to their athletes. After nine months at the AFLPA, Andrew accepted the personal excellence and well-being manager role at the Brisbane Lions. Andrew has joined five years at the Brisbane Lions and has established a successful and respected program. Andrew, please join us. Our next panel member is Annie Flamsteed. Um, the f who founded Inspire Tech, a Brisbane-based tech company that is on a passionate pursuit to improve individuals' wellness. Through her own experience as an elite gymnast, uh, she launched the Inspire Sport platform in 2017 and since then has released major updates to Inspire Sport Wellness Management System. Inspire Tech uses their innovative technology to provide wellness platforms for organizations in numerous industries. Annie, is an advocate for holistic well-being, putting the human before the athlete. That's why she believes that a healthy body is futile without a healthy mind. She strives to see positive change with the younger generations of sporting clubs and organizations alike. By implementing the, these core beliefs, Inspire is driving positive human behavior change, creating the game changers of tomorrow. So can I please request Annie to come up on stage? Our next panelist is Rachel Jones, who's the founder and director of Lift High Performance Consultants. She has a background in sport and exercise science and has held roles in strength and conditioning, athlete welfare, tactical training, and sports rehabilitation assessment and management, giving her, giving her an additional perspective to bring to her psychology work and a special interest in injury rehabilitation and pain management. She has experience working with elite athletes from Australian teams and organisations including Super Rugby, NRL, Wallabies, Australian Jockeys Association, Racing Queensland, Sporting Wheelies, Professional Golfers Association of Australia, AIS, Queensland Academy of Sport and more. Rachel is currently the lead sports psychologist for the Gold Coast Suns AFLW program, Queensland Cricket Women's program, Brisbane Heat and the Queensland Fire, QAS softball program and Football Queensland Women's program. Rachel, Rachel is also a network provider for the AFL Players Association. Rachel, would you like to join us on stage? <laughs> Last but not the least, uh, our next panel mem member is Krishnil Maharaj, uh, is in the unique position of having an athlete in national squads across two sports, athletics and football, a coach with a master's in sports coaching and a performance psychologist at the Mind and Movement Company. He works at the intersection of well-being and high performance, supporting athletes and teams from a range of sports in Australia and internationally both at the grassroots and elite level. He was Team Fiji's psychologist at the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games and has continued the role for the Tokyo 2020 and 2021 Olympic Games. Krish Neil has an acute understanding of mental health within the sporting landscape. He has a lived experience of performance anxiety during his time as an athlete and has supplemented his experience as a football coach by joining the wellbeing subcommittee of Football Coaches Australia. Krish Neil, 
if you'd like to make your way to stage, please. Being COVID safe. All right, we've got a few questions that have been submitted from the audience and those that are watching us online. Um, and it's right here in front of me, and I'm gonna start off with those first. So feel free to rotate between the panel, whoever wants to answer it. Research during the past decade reveals that overall a massive 46.4% of elite Australian athletes are experiencing symptoms of mental health problems. The most common mental health issues among sports people from highest to lowest are depression, eating disorder, general psychological distress, social anxiety, general anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. Let's look, at, let, let's look first at depression being top on the list. The physical and psychological demands placed upon athletes may predispose them to developing depression. As an athlete's symptom of mental illness intensifies, their performance can, negatively affect, can be negatively affected, leaving them vulnerable and exposed to further symptoms of common mental disorders. Now, what can be done to identify and manage the depression early before other disorders manifest? Opening it up to the panel. Um, yeah, I guess I can reflect on some of the things we are doing already in, in some sports uh, that I'm working with are further ahead than others. Um, in one of my sports, we actually screen athletes every month. Um, we, we do the K10 screening tool um, and highlight depressive symptoms. So we can find something that maybe an athlete's not comfortable disclosing, but when they actually see it um, and they enter a scale, that's a little bit easier for them to access that. And so we can follow that up um, and make sure that we're helping them to access the resources that they need. Um, as, as someone who I, I used to work with the um, the jockeys, the Queensland Jockeys Association, and run essentially what, what is like their employee assistance program for Queensland. And um, I went up to up north to a location for a critical incident and found out that there were a lot of mental health issues amongst the athletes up there. And they'd had our detail, the details of the EAP program and they had the number and, and everybody knew it was there and they had all access to all of it. But their comment was, well, we didn't know who you were. We didn't know who was going to answer the phone at the other end. Um, so making that accessible, I think, has, has gone a long way. Um, and so we took that on board and made sure we had a face there that people could connect with and make that step a little bit easier. I, um, just to add to that, I think um, something that's really important with any mental or physical illness, um, particularly mental, is the early screening and the early intervention. Um, so I think it's... Um, I'm not a psychologist or a doctor, but um, very passionate and, and sort of involved in this space and understanding um, the different signs that aren't necessarily that obvious. So screening is brilliant. It's really hard to screen three million kids that might do sport in the country though. So how can we implement strategies where we can screen them earlier for different things? Um, you know, in the industry that we're in, we work with a lot of community sport. And so um, we hear about the mental illness at elite sport a lot and lots of people talk about it. But if you, if you think about it, every single athlete, myself included, that's come out since retirement always says, oh, actually, now that I think about it, I was really struggling when I was 12 or 13 or 14 or this happened and then I was really nervous and I didn't know what to do or who to go to. So very similar, like there might be resources there but how do they access them and when they access them, what happens? Um, I think it's really sad to understand the lack of, I guess, accessibility. If you, I did a little trial with a particular uh, helpline a while ago and sent a message to it saying something quite distressing and it said, oh, sorry, no one's available right now. So I think we need to make things more accessible so that we can screen earlier. And I think another thing is educating people in the community, not necessarily at that professional elite level, what those warning signs are. So if you're coaching uh, gymnastics, for example, and you've got kids coming two days a week and you start to see that the kids are turning up with bruises and whatnot, you're, you're educated as a coach to report that as potential abuse. But if you start to see a kid coming to training, they've lost a substantial amount of weight, they're disengaged, they're fatigued, 
as a young coach, you don't know what to do. You're like, is it a mental illness? I'm not sure. So I think screening and education in the community earlier um, is going to allow us to use you know, prevention through prediction and actually drive change. Yeah, I was just going to say, we, um, one thing we've implemented at the Lions is um, normally what would happen is a player would arrive at the Brisbane Lions and then you know, the first two or three months we uh, assess that player and what their needs are. Uh, we sort of thought, how can we get in early to this? So our recruitment staff would meet and watch 150, 200 potential AFL players in their sort of 18th year. Uh, so we, we asked our recruitment staff if they were comfortable asking questions for us. Uh, so we put together a, a list of uh, questions uh, sort of based on, um, you know, what their ability to adjust, adjust would look like, what their work-life balance was. Uh, we then gathered all that information and we get an opportunity to sit down with, um, you know, a smaller range of players um, that are probably more likely to end up at the Lions and, and sort of continue on the, with that questioning. It's really important. So as soon as that player lands on our doorstep, we've got this long list of exactly what support this player needs. But even more importantly, it allows us to sit down with the parents two or three days after the drafts happen, talk about their son really confidently, um, allows us to work out what sort of accommodation they might need. Uh, so it just allows us to not only support the player, but uh, give the parents a, a sense of um, satisfaction that we've done our homework on, on that player and they're going to get looked after at the Lions. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that. And I completely agree that um, early intervention and education needs to be within community sport as well and not just at the elite level. The earlier we get, the better it is. Uh, our next question is more a performance-based question. Um, following on from Tracy's uh, conversation this morning on how um, she was performing under pressure, trying to beat the clock um, during one of the trials. Why do some athletes rise to the occasion when performing under pressure while others don't? Um, you know, we, we talk about concepts like the clutch and the choke. Why do some athletes clutch and why do others choke? That's a good question. I, if, if, <laughs> if anyone knows exactly why, uh, that, that'd be myself, great. To be um, no, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I look, um, I think uh, we've noticed at the lines that over the past four or five years that our players who have choked in the past, or and particularly things like goal kicking for us, is a, it's a stat since the beginning of time with AFL players that hasn't improved. It's the only probably stat in the AFL that hasn't improved. And it's amazing because it, as soon as, like I can kick the football from there to there, no problems at all, but as, as soon as you put two white posts up, it makes it really difficult. Um, <laughs> that's right. So I think uh, the players who get support for that and actually sit down with a psychologist and talk through strategies on how they can overcome those barriers, they're the ones that tend to perform under pressure. It's just a matter of um, us, I suppose, promoting the fact that they can um, better themselves by getting that type of support. Absolutely. Wonderful. I just, I just want to add to that. I think um, in terms of that, why is it that some of us, you know, all, you know, maybe all of us in certain moments perform well under pressure and other times they don't. I think um, really in terms of when working with our athletes, really trying to separate the the outcome that they're after, so whether it's kicking a goal and, and the process that they might look to follow that doesn't guarantee that they achieve that outcome but helps increase the chances of achieving that outcome and trying to really separate the, the process and the performance from the outcome and the result. And, and athletes are more likely to, I guess, be affected by pressure, choke under pressure, if they are really focused on the, on the outcome and the result rather than the process of it, um, and, and especially if they start then thinking about the, you know, the consequences of, hey, what, hap what happens if I score, what happens if I kick a goal, what happens if I don't, what's going to happen in the media, what's my teammates going to think, what's my coach going to think, all those types of things going into it, which actually you know, is outside of their control. Um, it, it's when there is that kind of external focus, results focus, um, that can uh, increase the chances of pressure impacting performance. Completely agree. Um, I think the key message for all athletes out there is, is to focus on the process over the outcome um, at that point in time. Uh, another question that's been submitted <coughs> is, is the panel aware of any motivational questioning or methods used to better understand what individual athletes want or value from being involved in sport to assist the transition into elite sport or help building understanding for coaches and parents? Quite a few questions in there. <laughs> I'll go, I'll, I'll read that out once again. Is the panel aware of any motivational questioning or methods 
used to better understand what individual athletes want or value from being involved in sport to assist the transition into elite sport or help building understanding for coaches and parents? I know this company called Inspire Tech and they, um, <laughs> they question athletes all the time. No, I'm joking, but I'm not actually at the same time. So we do a lot of stuff with young athletes and clubs. Um, and when an athlete is identified by the club, so um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Okay, so actually this is one I can use. My mom runs a gymnastics club and uh, they've got, I think, 1,500, 2,000 kids that come through their gym every week. Maybe three of them are talented. Like, that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. Um, gymnastics is a sport that you get identified very young as being talented, so six years old, seven years old. Um, and so actually understanding if that kid's talented or if they're actually wanting to do the sport, because if you're good at gymnastics, you're probably going to be good at running and jumping and swimming and other things as well. Um, at that age particularly, it's all about, like, is the kid, like, confident? Do they want to jump off a beam? Do they want to do this kind of stuff? So we've started to work with these clubs to actually understand how do we identify the traits of a, not a talented, but an athlete that's going to make it. And usually it's around motivation and why are you here? Why do you doing this? Oh, I like gymnastics. Like, it's fun, whatever. Or I want to be, I want to go to the Olympics or whatever it might be. So I think that there are questionnaires out there the biggest battle for us and for the clubs we work with is knowing what questions to ask. So what do you actually ask a six-year-old compared to a 16-year-old? Um, and then in a sport like gymnastics, you're identified at yeah, six, eight, 10. AFL, it's, you know, you might get drafted when you're 18. So you might be identified younger, but not drafted till much later. So I think it's understanding what to ask. I think the methods to ask those questions are there. And I think the clubs want to know and the national bodies and the pro teams want to have this info. Um, but outside of well-being, trying to understand the motivation, I, I don't think people really know what to ask. Psychologists, mm. do you know? <laughs> no, I, I don't think um, there's like a, a set rule or a set question or a set, of, a set of questions that we can ask to sort of really try and identify that. Um, I think that in order for, I guess, coaches and organisations to get the best out of an athlete, it's more about connecting with the person as opposed to the athlete. Um, and I've got absolutely no research to back this up. But um, I guess, you know, anecdotally, we see things like, you know, Wayne Bennett um, in the NRL. Um, he's definitely not the fastest bloke alive. He definitely can't lift any heavier than anyone else in the gym. But the thing that the playing group, and again, this is secondhand, tell me is that they can, he connects really well on a personal level. So things outside of rugby league. So, you know, there was a, an article recently uh, around Latrell Mitchell and they connected well because they're both, you know, from out west and they both love the country and, you know, are going to, you know, buy a farm and that sort of thing. And that's how, I guess, as an athlete, you may get that buy-in or that motivation because you're connecting well with the people that are sort of at the top of that tree and they've got your back. Mm. And just if I, if I can throw in a little bit of research in there... <laughs> um, there, there is good support for enriched environments and some of the ingredients that are required for an enriched environment where you do get that increased motivation. Psychological safety is the pillar. And uh, essentially, psychological safety... Is, sorry, it's the foundation. Um, essentially, that's the freedom to be yourself without fear of getting into trouble. So that's the freedom to go out and try things, make mistakes... I'm, I'm not going to have mum or dad on the sideline yelling at me, or like Tracy was saying, yelling at me on the way home um, because I miss one opportunity during the whole game or, or whatever it is. Or I'm not going to have the coach, you know, rip me to shreds because I tried something different. Um, so that that's the first piece. And then the pillars are um, connection, choice and motivation. So motivation to approach things rather than avoid things. And so it's understanding that and creating an environment that allows people to do that, that allows people to compete and go, actually, I'm just doing this for fun. I can compete at a high level and I'll still do everything that needs to be done, but I actually don't want to make the national team or I actually don't want to, um, you know, necessarily hit, hit a certain standard. I'm not driven by that. Whereas you'll have some athletes that are only driven by that but they're actually there to have fun and that's when they perform their best. So having that relationship with them, you're going to understand that and be able to create an environment where they can thrive. Wonderful. Um, our next question is actually following on from Rachel's comment over there. Um, you know, there's been a lot of in investment lately into talent identification and pathways and, and really supporting that transition. 
What would be some areas for athletes to prepare themselves for the changes associated when moving from community sport to a rep or elite sport and coaches' expectations are higher and more direct on them? We work a lot on this one. So we do individual development plans with all of our players and it's a lot of it's to do with off-field off engagement. One of the toughest questions that our players um, get asked and they can't answer is, what are your hobbies? And what we found is that uh, football has always been their hobby. That's been their fun, fun thing. So school's always been the pain in the back <laughs> type thing and mum and dad, on, uh, there's all lots of stresses and they've always gone to, to football as that's what I've done for fun. When they get into the AFL or whatever sport it might be, football becomes the stressor. So we try and engage them in some sort of other activity to, um, it, to basically uh, get away from, from the sport. Um, it's, it's crucially important. I think um, I, d I wasn't a professional athlete, but um, we, and we work mainly with community, but seeing them, some of our athletes go through to be pro and get drafted and stuff, what we always come back to and what seems to work every single time through like the educational resources that we create with partners and things like that is, as I think it was in my bio, um, dealing with the human before the athlete. Um, so I always say to my team, like the feeling that I get when I'm talking to, you know, US venture capital funds or we're flying to LA to speak on this panel or we're doing something like that is exactly the same feeling I used to get when I was terrified about like competing that day. And like Angie's laughing because we competed together and I would choke every comp, like every single comp. And I was, I've always been like four feet tall and talented and all that fun stuff, um, but just couldn't pull it together. And ultimately what it came down to as I realised as I transitioned into being like a tech founder and into this sort of CEO lifestyle was it's all about having the education and the skills you need to be a human being. So things like can you cook, can you clean, you know, can you be on time to a meeting? Can you do this? Can you do that? Like, and little things like how do you manage your stress and emotional response to situations? So it wasn't that gymnastics made me nervous or competing made me nervous. It was that I would get nervous when I had to perform. So performing for anything, exams, you know, trying to make my parents happy, trying to make my friends happy, whatever it might be. Um, so I think developing a skill set in a human being, whether they're going to be pro or not, is absolutely paramount because then if they make it great they're better prepared for it if they don't make it awesome we've got better humans in society that are, are better at living and they're going to be better parents and they're going to be better people so um it's a massive job it's definitely not an easy thing to do but i think the earlier you start developing those skills and those habits and understanding of how am i feeling today um it's interesting when you see an athlete become elite and all of a sudden they've got a psychologist and a dietitian and they've got a, an AMS and they've got all this stuff and they're like great but for 15 years I had none of that so how do I use this what do I do why is it important so we either see either massive compliance issues or we see this year or so of re-educating and rehabilitating these athletes before they can actually perform at the level we know they can physically um, so I think it comes down to how prepared can we make these people and then if they make it to your squad, awesome, because they're going to be brilliant um, and or more brilliant than they already are. And if they don't, then great. And then I think from the transitioning out of sport, they're more prepared for that as well. Because if they can live before sport, during sport, after sport, it's going to be a lot easier for them as well. To play devil's advocate there, um, who do you think that responsibility falls to to help them, I guess, gain these skills or exercise those skills? I get asked this question all the time. And I love it because um, I love calling it for what it is. I actually think it's multifaceted. I think if you're in a sport that's governed nationally or by a federated body, and a lot of the stuff we do in the States, sports um, set up very differently over there. Um, in Australia, where it's a bit challenging because we've got national bodies, we've got state bodies, we've got districts, we've got clubs. Then we've got individual coaches. Then we've got parents and siblings and the social media and all that stuff. So I think that it's... I think, my blanket answer is always it's a massive community responsibility for everybody to be aligned in their thinking of how are we actually developing young people into being people, not just athletes. However, I think if we're talking in the elite sense or we're talking in that if, like you're an athlete that's been identified, you're in a program, it absolutely falls on the responsibility of the national body or the state body um, who's in involved in that athlete's life very closely. When we're talking community sport, 
it really comes down to making sure that there's systems in place. And again, that can start at national body, but they don't have access to the clubs necessarily. And sometimes in sport, even the state bodies don't have access to the clubs. Um, so what it comes down to is having the right frameworks in place, but then having the right, I guess, measures like technology and things that can get those things and those policies and things out to Dolby where there's a AFL club that may, you know, might be on the website, but they might not know that it's there. Um, so I think the responsibility comes down to who's leading the way, um, but I actually don't think that it falls or has to fall on who's at the top of the pile. Um, if we're working with clubs and our clubs are educating their parents and the parents are educating their kids, it's really important. Um, and then, you know, there's always going to be outliers to that because you might have a sport like that has this great national framework and they fund it into every state and the states push it down to their clubs and the clubs comply with it and the coaches do the right thing and the kids use whatever it is and then the parent might be like, you're shit for having Maccas for dinner. And that's an awful thing to say. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that on a panel. But um, they might say something like that and then all that work's undone. So I think it really needs to be this holistic approach to education. Um, I think government has a huge role to play in that in terms of the frameworks and the accessibility to creating these things. Um, but then it really comes down to people respecting people's, you know, clinical um, opinions and research and then also working with the times and realising, like, who are you trying to get this information to? If it's to a kid... Don't put it on a website where they have to admit all these things and do all this stuff they're not going to be able to do. Get it in their hands in a way that they can understand. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a roundabout way of saying it's everyone's responsibility, um, but it's going to be different for every sport, and I think every sport and every government body needs to look at it and go, how is our sport structured and governed, and what's the most logical way f for us to make an impact? Is it through bottom-up or top-down or... Yeah. You can talk more of later if you like. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, our next question, I'm going to actually slightly modify this a little bit. Um, you know, we often talk about the latest conversations around resourcing and funding, especially in community sports, you know, when you can't afford to have a dietitian, a sports psychologist, a strength and conditioning coach. Um, what are some supporting resources that the sporting organisations and clubs should utilise to manage and improve the mental health and wellbeing of young athletes? So what are some free sources out there or things that they can utilise? I think your number one resource is your people. And that's something that's educating the people within each club on what to look for. There's um, you know, mental health training that, that um, people can access. Um, I, mean, I, I talk a lot about uh, the programs that we run. None of them cost us any money. Uh, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, or we, we've built pretty much every every uh, monitoring tool or um, yeah, dashboard, anything like this, that it's we put some really simple process in, simple things like you talked about the emojis, um, you know, the happy face, the sad face, the in-between face, you know, write your name under one of um, the faces and drop it into a box, simple things like that. So there's some really simple things that you can do. There's some programs that you're putting together that are accessible as well. So there's, there's a lot out there. I think um, this is not necessarily our, like our technology is great and everyone should use it, but technology in general is how you should, how we're going to actually like reach people at scale, whether it's through a platform like ours or whether it's through another platform, whether it's social media. The reality is, is that kids and adults and everyone, even my 95 year old grandma is on technology, are using technology. So if we can... And I, I used a, an example before of the eating disorder space. So um, it's a space that is just really challenging. Um, one, it used to be really hard to get a diagnosis. So uh, you guys would probably know this in clinical. I, I don't know how long ago it changed, but recently, I believe. Um, if you didn't have a certain BMI, it didn't matter what you were, what you were exhibiting, you couldn't get a diagnosis and you couldn't get like Medicare-supported um, sessions. Now, that's really challenging for people who might have binge eating disorder or another eating disorder that's not your you know, s typical skeletal anorexia. So um, there's been a lot of change that's happening in the space, in mental health and in eating disorders and things like that, and I think it's brilliant. Um, but even still, there's a new clinic that's been set up, but it's only got 17 beds. The waiting list has, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of kids on it or, or people on it. 
Um, so if we can use a combination of face-to-face -face intervention and face-to-face -face support and then some kind of technology to monitor or reach or distribute educational or content or to you know, partially diagnose or to screen um, at scale, I think that's really the only way that we're actually going to do something that's affordable because um, there are programs and, and places out there for mental health and addiction and things like that, but there's one that I know for a fact, four weeks costs 100 grand. Um, and yeah, it's brilliant and it's, you, you know, get great treatment and great therapy, but that's just not accessible. Um, however, the principles of going there for four weeks, I'm sure we could achieve a, p a portion of through technology um, or at least continue that. So I think technology, whether that be um, to distribute content, capture data, um, manage in, in between appointments. I mean, even things like being able to book an appointment online, uh, I think outside the locker room, you can go in there and you can say, oh, where's a counsellor near me? That use of technology is brilliant and that wasn't there five years ago, ten years ago. So um, I know it sounds biased coming from the tech founder sitting on this panel, but really the way of the future moving forward is, is a combination. Yeah, I think also from the human el element uh, going in a slightly different direction, I'd love to see more coach development and coach training in this space because there's a willing audience there and I think parent engagement as well. Um, having been involved in a, in a few different systems where you know, the funding is, is for the, the top level but we're trying to, to bring the younger age groups along with, with us because it's like, well... You know, if someone comes up to me and they're, they're struggling or there's a parent that's struggling and doesn't know what to do, I'm not going to just leave them, um, but finding ways that we can do that so we can actually upskill um, coaches so they don't feel like they're drowning in the deep end either and they actually know what to look for or they know that that athlete who's not being compliant or is, you know, bringing down the whole team at training, for example actually has a lot of stuff going on at home or actually can't get to training at time on time because they're catching two trains and a bus to actually get to training because mum and dad are off doing something else unhealthy and can't actually be there for their child. And then also encouraging the parents as well to know how to support their kids and what resources are out there. You know, we're getting better and better at, at talking about mental health but w there's still a bit of a gap there in, in knowing what resources are available and how and when you qualify for those resources and how to access those things. So I would love to see that. But also with coaches, I'd also love to see, you know, e even today we're, we're focusing a lot on athletes, but I'd actually really love to see some mental health support for coaches and staff. Like I had a, a bunch of athletes in a hub for six weeks last year and there were about five, four or five different sources of support for the athletes. And I kept asking people, what about the staff? What are we doing for the staff? What support is there for the staff? And I had coaches calling me going, this environment is ridiculous. We just can't get away. There's, there's sport everywhere and we can't actually get out of it or even get, you know, the, the simplest request that they were asking for was a gym session that was purely coaches and no athletes allowed in there. So they couldn't be disturbed for, you know, half an hour or an hour of their day. And that was even hard to access. So I, th I think that's an important part of the conversation as well. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on that in terms of, in terms of the coaches' um, mental health as well, because we're talking about, you know, sport and mental health, and that's such an important point. And one of the hats that I wear is as, uh, as on the wellbeing subcommittee for Football Coaches Australia, and that's um, we've done a little bit of research with UQ around even just employment conditions. If you think about sort of a coach's employment situation, you know, they're quite often moving across the country, across the world, often without that family support, and, you know, their, their contracts can be torn up pretty, pretty quickly. So um, it's so important to, yeah, look at that holistically and go, well, let's have a look at the whole system in terms of coaches and their awareness about mental health for themselves and for their athletes. Um, but administrators as well, you know, how, how much, how many of our sports administrators, uh, you know, have training around even something as simple as uh, mental health first aid. And I think if we look at that and that idea uh, that Annie's t talking about, uh, you know, scaling and technology is such an amazing way to scale. I think another way to scale is getting coaches involved because you think about how many athletes uh, coaches come across each year and so if they have that training and awareness both for their own uh, mental health but are able to role model that role model things like help seeking um, you know provide resources and support and go hey here's here's what you can go to or you know you can look up this this company you know they they provide lots of resources or you know the you know 
plethora of kind of growing resources around it and they can role model that help seeking and vulnerability, I think there's an avenue for scale in, in that way. I think ideally we need to also make sure that there's some funding set aside for things like prevention and education as opposed to intervention, you know, after the event has happened. Because I think, um, you know, health economists have said like $1 um, for prevention and education means $3 out there. You know, if we're thinking NHMRC is, you know, half million to $1 million pots, if we can focus, you know, some of that money to prevention, I think we're in the long term anyway, we're going to get outcomes for not just our athlete community. Wonderful. Um, just being mindful of time over here, uh, we should have technically been done by now, but I've got a list of 38 questions submitted um, and we definitely can't cover about it, uh, cover all of these questions and we'll end up talking all day and, and that shows the need for such, uh, more such forums. Um, but we're, we're very fortunate here in Queensland to have this event in person and I really want to engage the audience and, and see if any of you had any questions for our panel. Uh, and, and also thank you for, for being here. <laughs> the mic will go around. Dr. Arms taking the mic around. Yep, we've got one. Also from a tech company, so this, this is going to be slightly swayed, but I apologise in advance. Um, but what do we think is the top thing? Like, the key thing that's stopping us in Australia from realising that wellbeing culture across sport in your chosen fields? Like, what's what's the one thing? Because obviously we know there's a problem, we know we're all working on it, but what's the one thing, if we could target our effort, or the couple of things, if we could target our effort on that, what, what would it be? I think um, it's a bit of a diffusion of responsibility when it comes to you know, the breakdowns of organisations, whether we're at the national level or the state level or the community level. I think if we have one big wraparound mandate, legislation, whatever the case may be, saying, you know, we need to do this and everyone's on the same hymn sheet, then I think it goes a long way to solving some of these issues. I think it's also a resources and funding issue. Um, so I've had many conversations with sports and organisations that go, this is a priority for us. We know we have, we really need to have a psychologist on board, but we, it, it's not on our priority in terms of our funding. And it's a luxury item, and so we won't fund you, or we'll only fund you a day a week. And you're trying to fit all of your athletes into a, into a day a week, and you're trying to find a way to make that work. Um, so that, that, that gets really challenging, especially, you know, in one of my sports, es essentially, um, there's, a, there's a target that I've been told to prioritise the top athletes, which unfortunately happens because there's a lack of funding. But I'm essentially contracted just over half a day a week to look after about 100 athletes. Now, that's just not feasible. Um, and it's something that I really struggle with as, as a bit of a perfectionist and someone that doesn't want to let anybody fall through the cracks. But it's just, it's just not realistic. So, th so that's a really big deal. And I think a big part of that as well is shifting from just doing things to tick the box. Like, okay, we've, we've done our mental health training for the year. We've ticked that box. We have mandatory mental health training and, and we've done it here, here and here. We've, we've provided an external provider and we've given everybody the name and the number and, and that's there. But we haven't looked at whether it's actually working. And I have the benefit of working across a number of different sports and I can see the difference in uptake when there is that disconnect between the, the, uh, the provider and, and in, in some situations, if that's worked really well within the organisation, like there's that connection point and people are really well educated about it, there's somebody there who can go, hey, I think you'll really benefit from this resource. Like Will, Will gave a great example before. He had two people... Um, uh, that he could connect with and, and talk to to make that conversation a bit easier to source someone who was a good fit for him. And, and that's the piece I think sometimes we're missing is, is that how do we connect people to these resources and make that more accessible as opposed to just going, well, we've done mental health training, we've ticked the box, but we haven't got that long-term result. Really quickly, I think, and this is probably a controversial one, I think winning so, you know, at, we, we get to a point where we're really close to achieving the ultimate success. 
And I think some of our coaches might go, okay, well, let's, let's park that mindfulness session this week and just work on a skill rather than that. It might be something as simple as instead of spending that hour walking around and talking to our whole playing group, I'm going to spend an extra hour this week working on our opposition. Um, so I think our, my job in particular is to remind our coaches that they're the reasons, those, those types of things are the reasons we are in this position to win. Yeah, I think um, in addition to what everyone said, I think one of the, I guess, barriers towards um, having more of a wellbeing culture is just the attitude um, that we have at, at every level, whether that's at the, at the athlete level, whether that's the parent level, coach level, um, going all, all the way up to the sport in terms of how important is this, um, how important is wellbeing. Certainly the, from the mental health side of things, I think the physical health has, has really changed and the mental health side of things is, is playing catch up and it's, you know, it's, it's got a long way to go. Um, but I think there's that gap between, well, how important do I see this as being yet compared to something like winning, for example, and that attitude then is going to drive a particular behaviour, you know, so if, if I'm, you know, prioritising winning uh, over someone's mental health, then that's going to show up in, in the way that we, you know, in terms of the culture that we create within the team or the industry or the sport or, or the family unit, you know, whatever it might be. Can I just to add to that, I think a really good solution to that is you make mental health a performance problem. Because, again, again, I think Will said it before, I keep quoting Will, um, you know, a happy athlete is a faster athlete, you know? So if we make that, there was one of my teams that recently I brought, brought on specifically for performance, because they'd had lots of team issues, and the coach said, we want to draw a line in the sand, we're not dealing with the team culture stuff anymore, this is fresh, let's work on performance. And I probably spend the majority of my time looking after mental health in that role, but have the freedom to do that because then we have more players available for selection because they're mentally healthy and they're not missing time away from training and things like that. So I, I think that's how we solve that, is we make mental health a performance problem. Mindfulness is a great example. There's, there's really great performance benefits from doing mindfulness. And so, again, that's a way you can kind of sell it and go, oh, but by the way, you can also use it here, here and here as well as your performance. And then you broaden that application. I think... I can I can see Michael and Annie both having the microphone. I'm just going to jump in there and say that I I I really thirty seconds each. I I really long for the day that we see you know psychologists or sports psychologists sitting there alongside you know head coach, S and C, physio. Like we scaffold so well for the physical athlete, and yet we're not taking care of the thing that's really going to point that athlete in a direction. Yeah, I think all I'll add to that is um, I agree with all of that, Um, but we're all a room full of very well educated people um and i think one massive thing that's needed is i don't think coaches like i've never met a coach or someone who's in sport who doesn't want or or, sorry who wants to negatively impact the life of one of their athletes i just don't think they really know that it's happening i remember and andrew we've actually spoke about this as athletes like if your coach says oh that was a really heavy landing as a 15 year old kid you go i need to lose weight and they're not saying that but that's where you go so educating coaches educating parents educating the community on language and how to actually prevent these things is so needed because it can again be so um like what am i trying to say unintentional um at a pro level to avoid it or at a community level to cause it um and that's such an easy thing to fix if we all fix it in a way that's educating each level not just the athlete or not just the physio or not just the psychologist Wonderful. Um, well, that brings us to the conclusion of the panel today and just wanted to uh, re-emphasise on the points made by Krishna, or Rachel and Michael on, on treating mental health as a performance problem and then putting it out there because even today we don't have as many full-time roles in the sports psychology place, most of them are consulting, uh, but in the physical preparation place we've got lots, lots of roles and lots of literature uh, supporting that area. So more focus and more discussions like this is really needed um, to wrap that up. Um, Please give a big round of applause for our panel members. Uh, they were fantastic today. So if panelists, if you could remain seated, I uh, would like to give you an engraved plaque as a gesture of appreciation. Uh, Susan's already over it. <laughs> uh, as a gesture of appreciation from MHFA. And could I also please invite Auntie Peggy, Corey, Curley, Tracy, and Will to join us on stage for a photo, please. 
But just while we're doing that photo, I'm just going to invite up uh, Pushpa, uh, who is the um, Mental Health Foundation of Australia's leader of multicultural ambassadors. And uh, while we're doing this photo, Pushpa is going to do our vote of thanks. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of Mental Health Foundation Australia for being here, both online and in person. Truly grateful. Uh, very grateful for Corey Sells, Kirili Dunton. Thank you. Senator the Honorable Richard Colbeck, Tracy Stockwell, Will Stockwell, Michael Duhigg. Andrew Crowell, Annie Flamsteed, Rachel Jones, Krishnil Maharaj, and Narsima Ravi for your insights, education, and definitely words of wisdom that no, not only impacts people on a mental health but a psychological level, and truly with a mindfulness also touching the emotional side because it all interacts as one. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all our ambassadors. If our ambassadors just want to say have a quick wave, Ram Prakuti Narsima, Deputy Leader. And uh, also thank you to Susan for making this happen. She's managed to cross the border for every event so far. A uh, very big, big, big thank you to our National Mental Health Month major sponsors, Australian Unity and Chemist Own and Sponsor Foot Solutions, as well as, well, that's them. And finally, thanking you all, our guests, and you know, just being here with your vibrant energy and supporting a phenomenal cause that Mental Health Foundation, Aus Foundation Australia not only does for the Mental Health Month, but does it throughout the year. And you know, we'd be really appreciated if you could just share that uh, great incentive and access to lots of phenomenal events. And please do inquire about the gala dinner we have on the 30th of October, which is next week. It's gonna be phenomenal, great entertainment, having a meal together and just connecting with each other. Thank you. Thank you.